this is an update uh, of work I began a little over a year ago, and I gave a, a preliminary report uh, at the last annual meeting. Uh, it's a collaboration I have with a number of physicists at Purdue University. Uh, what happened is that I was visiting National Solar Observatory, and uh, Mark Giampapa showed me two articles that caught my attention, which I'll show you in a few minutes, and that led me to contact uh, Ephraim Fishbach and his colleagues at Purdue, and I've been collaborating with them since. It's a problem involving nuclear physics, and which I know uh, extremely little, and solar physics. So I'm the solar physics part of the, of the project, and my colleagues here take care of the nuclear physics. Well, uh, this goes back to 1951, uh, influential article by Rutherford and his colleagues, and uh, concerning radioactive elements. And uh, they suspected that radioactivity was unaffected by environmental effects. They put this to the test, they put some radium in the middle of a bomb, exploded the bomb, and they were able to monitor the account rates during the explosion, and they found no change, although the uh, temperature went up to 2,500 degrees and pressure up to 1,000 atmospheres. Uh, and um, a recent, well, 1972 review article on nuclear decay rates states that one of the paradigms of nuclear physics, nuclear science, has been the general understanding that the half-life or decay constant of radioactive substance is independent of extra nuclear considerations. And that's what we all learned in Physics 101, uh, but it happened not to be true. Now, a quick review. Um, there are various kinds of decays. Alpha decay is emission of an alpha particle. Uh, beta decay is emission of an electron. And uh, the effects that I'll be talking about appear to involve only beta decays. Uh, okay. And that's the um, difference between betas and alphas. Alpha is governed by the strong nuclear force, and beta decays by the weak nuclear force, which also involves neutrinos, which I think will play a key role in this project. So here's an example of a decay of radium, which is one of the subjects uh, of the uh, investigation. Uh, when a beta particle is emitted, the uh, radium transfers to actinium, uh, the same uh, atomic mass, but uh, a different atomic number. Okay. Okay. Now, what caught my attention was the fact that a, a, a year ago, I knew of, I, was a, I learned about two experimental groups who had each been studying the decay rates of elements, and each found an annual variation in the decay rates. Uh, one group was carried out. Experiments carried out at Brookhaven National Laboratory by Alberg and his colleagues. And this is a plot of the results. These are actually seven point running means to smooth it. And uh, the red line is the inverse of the Sun Earth distance, uh, normalized to be similar to the uh, amplitude of the decay rate variations. And you see that they both, sh that the uh, decay rates seem to show a very obvious annual variation. The phase is not exactly the same as the one you would expect from the Sun-Earth distance and eccentricity. Uh, another group in Germany, Siegert and his, and his colleagues, have carried out analysis of several elements, but one on which is radium, and that went on for about 12 years, and you see it's an even more striking uh, fit to the annual variation curve. So uh, the f question was, what is going on? And the experimenters, of course, were convinced there's something wrong with their experiment. They were unable to pin down exactly what it was. But obviously, uh, 
decay rates don't change, so there had to be something wrong with the experiment. Well, for various reasons, uh, Ephraim Fischbach decided to look into this more carefully, and um, he, he finding these and one other uh, experimental set all showing annual variation, he suspected that something real was going on, and annual variation suggested that maybe the sun would be involved since the sun-earth distance varies uh, on a one-year time scale. So this is why I came in, and <clears throat> as long as one is looking only at an annual variation, physicists will be very concerned because radon flux and temperature and uh, pressure all vary with an annual time scale. So I thought if one is looking for evidence of uh, a solar effect, one should look for some other signal which one can associate with the sun, and one is solar rotation. And uh, there is no unique solar rotation rate, even the surface of the sun, the rotation rate varies uh, over quite a wide range, but um, a reasonable uh, search band would be between 10 and 15 cycles per year, and the left-hand uh, curve shows an a, a time frequency analysis of uh, some of the data from the Brookhaven experiment, the chlorine data. And it shows, uh, it shows very clearly that the one year, uh, one cycle per year variation at the very bottom, uh, running throughout the time scale, drifting off toward, fading away a little toward the end, interestingly enough, this may be an experimental effect because all the, all the uh, variations uh, seem to fade away towards the end. But it shows very clearly uh, features with frequencies of 10.9 cycles per year and 12.7 cycles per year, uh, which fall in the search band for possible rotation rates. A little on the low side, but there we are. On the right-hand side is silicon, and um, that shows... Uh, uh, very little in the, in the search band and very little in the one cycle per year. And this shows uh, that different elements behave differently. Whatever is going on, it's not uniform. It's not the same for all elements. This is a power spectrum uh, from the BNL data and uh, chlorine on the left, silicon on the right, and they show clear peaks at one cycle per year, 11.1 and 12.7. But uh, they're more pronounced uh, for, for the chlorine than for the silicon, as we recently just, just noticed. So one can do a test to say if this is real or not. And one simple test is to shuffle the data. You have a list of uh, times, dates of measurement. You have a list of the measurements. You, you, uh, you don't change the times, you don't change the measurements, but you rearrange them, you, you shuffle them, and you assign the measurement to the wrong time. So you can do this many times over, and I uh, did it 10,000 times, and not once did I get a peak as big as the actual peak in the, uh, in the, in the power spectrum. And uh, with a different display, I was able to infer there's only about one chance in a million of getting a peak in the search band as big as that which we actually find. Uh, now, this, this, is the, the, this, is the book, this is the German experiment, and on the left is radium, on the right, europium, one of the uh, elements they looked at, and a tremendously strong signal at one cycle per year in radium and nothing in europium. And this by itself tells you that it is not an instrumental effect or an environmental effect, because that would be, you have the same instrumentation, same environment for radium and for europium, and so you would see uh, this, if, it, if the peak were due to, if the modulation were due to environmental effects or instrumentation, you see the same signal in both data sets, and you don't. So, um, all right. And this, again, is a power spectrum. As I said, uh, the fact you see a tremendous peak, uh, sorry, power of uh, about 500 in, the, uh, in radium and n practically nothing in europium shows that it is not an instrumental or an environmental effect. Uh, well, it is interesting to be able to combine data sets 
and see what is common between two data sets. And it's rather like forming a correlation function, but working with power spectra instead of the time series themselves. I won't go the details here, but there is a way of combining a two power spectra, S1 and S2, in such a way that what you form from it, uh, which is uh, this quantity J, it has the same exponential distribution that the power itself. And that makes it easy to interpret the significance of whatever comes out of this power spectrum analysis. And so uh, what I've done here is to uh, combine, now here I'm looking for a link with neutrinos, and in particular with low energy neutrinos. There are two low energy neutrino experiments in which we have data. One is GALX, uh, using a gallium uh, experiment, and the other is Homestake using chlorine. And uh, uh, so I combined data from those two neutrino experiments. I also combined them, oddly enough, with irradiance data, which appears to be related to neutrinos in a, in a way that's very, very interesting, uh, very surprising, and it's uh, uh, a challenge to understand exactly why there is this close relationship. But when you combine these four data sets, GALAX, an acronym for the, for the GALAX interval, HOMESTAKE, an acronym for the HOMESTAKE interval, you get a tremendous peak with a power of 40, way, uh, way above the noise level, um, with a frequency, well-defined, sharply defined frequency <coughs> at 11.85 uh, uh, cycles per year. And this is interesting because, uh, ah, this is a, a, a gain, a shuffle test showing there's only about uh, two chances in 10,000 of getting a statistic this large. This is playing around only with the neutrino data, leaving the the ACRAM data unchanged. If you were to change ACRAM data as well, shuffle that too, it would be uh, much more significant than that. So this is a plot of the known internal rotation rate of the sun. And uh, this is the convection zone from about 0.75 solar radii out to, out to the photosphere. And the rotation rate is about 14.5 cycles per year, the, the actual uh, sidereal rotation rate. Below that is the radiative zone, which is not as well, well, it's fairly well determined here, not as well determined here, and that's about 13.5 cycles per year. But what we find from our analysis of neutrinos and irradiance, and actually from the data, decay data as well, uh, is a much lower frequency uh, at about 12.85. Uh, and uh, my interpretation of this is that the neutrino data is telling us the rotation rate of the core of the sun, which really is otherwise unknown. Helioseismology does, does not go as deep as, uh, as the core, which is the rate is about 0.25 and below. So um, um, it is, it's, but after all, neutrinos are a result of nuclear reactions. The nuclear reactions all occur in the core of the sun. So it's only logical that if neutrinos show any periodicity, it's likely to be the periodicity of the core, not of an outer layer. And, uh, and there's one more, one more test. So, so far we have two pointers uh, that the decay rates and some of the other effects are related to the core of the sun. Um, one, or the sun itself, one is the annual variation, and the other is the, is the, the periodicity which we can relate to the rotation rate of the core. As one more, there's another periodicity well known in solar physics discovered by uh, Eric Rieger and his colleagues many years ago, which has a period of 154 days. Okay, I haven't been watching you. And um, um, it, it is a, an arm mode oscillation given by this formula. So what I did is say, well, supposing the same oscillation occurs in the core of the sun, uh, we use the same formula, use the same values of L and M, but we replace the rotation rate of the convection zone, which gives the one for four days, with the rotation rate of the core, as we infer, and this then leads us to 
uh, expect uh, peaks where the arrow is shown at 2.14. And here I show plots of what you find in the BNL data and in the radium data, and you find peaks at exactly uh, where you expect them. So this shows that R mode oscillations also are going on in the core and uh, give rise to, do I stop this? Okay, but, but well, I, I am through, I'm through. Uh, uh, and I say, uh, this is a search for a well-defined frequency. It turns up in both BNL and PTP data. Uh, thank you, Peter. How do I stop the, the beeping? Oh. oh, somebody else stopped it. Thank you. All right. Well, if you want to get a few things, as, as we mentioned at the beginning, if you want to uh, have a question, please come to the center of the microphone uh, there so we don't... Uh, so I saw a hand go up in the back, so uh, please come on up. And, uh, of course, if you have any quick comments while they're coming, <laughs> you can get in. No, uh, I've, I've got through my slides. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Sir? I have two questions about this Please intensely interesting research. Um, first, um, I see that in both the cases you showed, the um, phase of the cycle does not really agree with the phase of the uh, solar distance. Exactly, exactly. Have you explored exactly. what phase it yes, might correspond exactly, to? Exactly, exactly. Is there some other phase in yes. the moment which it might correspond to? Uh, it, means that the, uh, it means that the flux of neutrinos is not determined purely by the sun-earth distance. There's something else. And the something else is related to the tilt of the sun's axis with respect to the ecliptic. I mean, have, have you tied it times in? the year, you you're seeing more than north. So have you tied it into that and got the correct phase of it? Excuse me? Have you tied it into that and, uh, and dug out the, right, the correct phase? Uh, uh, actually, uh, the phase, there's no, the phase is different for different elements. And so there are two effects, each giving an annual variation. One is the Earth-Sun distance. The other is whether you're seeing the northern hemisphere or southern hemisphere of the sun. Yes. And the, mi the mixture of the two effects is different for different elements. Ah, that's very but interesting. One can, you're, but you're, you're they, they all fit this, yeah. this pattern. Yeah. Yes. Can, can we allow another so speaker have, well, may I, may I, so we don't have a question. dialogue? Oh, uh, there's some other people oh, waiting to uh, ask questions. So. Any uh, speculation as to why uh, this neutrino flux uh, influences no. uh, different elements uh, differently? No, uh, that is a problem for the nuclear physicists, and it is not uh, something explained by current neutrino theory. So if this effect is correct, and the evidence seems pretty strong, it will call for a de further development in the theory of neutrinos. Thank you. This seems to me very important, and so uh, I've looked into it a little bit too, and, and um, I, I'll offer one other, um, um, not a theory, but just an observation for your comment, and that is that the Kramer um, transactional interpretation implies in a sense that any emission like a radioactive decay must have a receiver, a, a, um, an absorber at the other end, and so um, if radioactive decay has some variations involved, it might have to do with what's around that could be absorbers. And so perhaps yeah. the sun being one big yeah. thing there has some effect. Uh, I, I, well, I think my relevance. guess is you're on the right track. Um, I'll get, what, is, what seems to be the case is that the flux of neutrinos, an environment of a density of neutrinos, influences the decay rate. This is a heretical suggestion, but I suppose it may be put forward in this forum. Your period of approximately 12.7, uh, your frequency about 12.7 per year, is also very close to a lunar period. Yes, sure. But it's distinguishable. That's what I wanted to ask. Is, is the lunar period outside the... Uh, yeah, ruled out yes, by the accuracy is, of the data? Is, yes, yes. Ah, it's very important. Not consistent, yeah. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Somebody else.